The epistle for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost here in Sparta, New Jersey, taken from 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 4, verse 1 through 10. This was one of the favorite epistles of St. Paul, here it is, of Archbishop Lefebvre. Here it is. Brethren, I make known unto you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast after what manner I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's St. Peter, and after that by the eleven. Then was he seen by more than five hundred brethren at once, of whom many remain until this present day, and some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all he was seen also by me, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace in me hath not been void. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew, St. Mark, chapter 7. At that time, Jesus, going out to the coast of Tyre, came by Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coast of Decapolis, and they brought to him one who was deaf and dumb. And they besought him that he would lay his hand upon him, and taking him from the multitude apart, he put his fingers into his ears, and spitting, he touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he groaned and said to him, Epheta, which means, Be thou opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke correctly. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, the more, the, so much the more did they publish it a great deal. And so much the more did they wonder, saying, <coughs> He hath done all things well. He has made both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <clears throat> After the Mass, you're all most welcome to come and have the refreshments and uh, supper here. I have the, uh, we're on the tail end of our pilgrimage with, um, what is it, 11 boys, two seminarians from Our Lady Mount Carmel and myself. We've had this uh, big pilgrimage going to the great shrines in Buffalo, Our Lady of Victories, and then up to Midland, where St. John the Brebeuf and St. Gabriel Lamont, both priests, were brutally put to death and tortured and we have the happiness, I had the happiness to offer Mass right on the grounds where St. John Brebo died. And we prayed on the grounds where St. Gabriel was tortured. They dug out his eyes and filled the sockets with red hot coals. That's just one of the tortures they put him through. For the love of souls, to spread the Catholic faith, to bring America and Canada under Christ the King. That's, that's the whole purpose why they died martyrs and out of love for their souls. So it was a great joy to be there and uh, to pray at these shrines. And then uh, we took the boys up to Quebec City and Montreal, where there's just thousands of churches, shrines, saints, venerable blessed. And we got to pray at a number of them. And then uh, we made our way south to uh, Vermont and now here. And, and this week, we're going to hike some of the Poco Mountains, Poconos, and then uh, they'll see Gettysburg, Emmitsburg, where St. Elizabeth Ann Seton is buried, and hopefully Antietam, Bloody Lane, and then uh, back to Kentucky. So pray for these boys on this pilgrimage. They'll be here for supper, of course. They had Mass this morning, and um, <clears throat> so you're welcome to come. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Never, perhaps, 
in all of human history as man, as a mass, as they lose the Holy Catholic faith since the time of the humanism of the 1500s and then the Protestant Revolution and then the hitting of the Freemasonic Revolution, waving its flag of liberty, equality, fraternity without Christ, without God, and man made into a God. That's the doctrine of Freemasonry. Man replacing God. In God we trust, it says on the dollar bill. And what is it? Man. It's all man. The rights of man was the great, or rather notorious document of the French Revolution, sister to the American Revolution. And this revolution was throwing Christ out of the political world, out of the church, out of all society. It took a long time to get inside the Catholic Church. And they were working at it over 100 years ago with modernism seeping into the seminaries, into the bishops, into the, into the, even into the monasteries and convents. And by the time of Vatican II, it exploded, exploded. So much so that the Freemasons boast and say John the 23rd was the greatest pope that ever existed. Paul the Sixth, they love and worship him. They bow down in solemn uh, adoration of Pope John Paul II and Benedict XVI and all, and Pope Francis, of course. All the enemies of Christ love these popes because they are promoting the revolution which is the continual, ever-changing revolt against Christ as king over all. That's what the revolution means. We will not have this man, who is God and man, reign over us. That's what the revolution is all about. And it is slippery, it is all infecting, it is a plague over the entire globe of the earth right now. And we breathe it in, we're all infected. The media, the propaganda, the advertisement, Hollywood, the bad music, the even expressions people use. All these things were so inebriated with liberalism and this Freemasonic spirit that we have to sometime we have to get back to clear Catholic thinking. So never before have men been more mute, unable to speak the truth especially popes, bishops, priests, who are supposed to speak the truth, bark the truth, even at the cost of being put to death. We have to preach the Catholic truth. And now we see these popes who are all huggy and kissy and shaking hands with all these even sodomites, open sodomites, and pardon me, transgenderites, and all these the foul corruption of society who normally would be executed publicly because they are so foul and promote such an anti-natural lifestyle that, that, that cuts at the heart of, of a normal family life. And this is the goal of also the enemy is to crush and overthrow the family by divorce, get the woman out of the home, get her in pants, get her lifting weights, chewing tobacco and acting like a man, uh, or the other extreme, acting like a loose prostitute. That's the goal, and that's what Hollywood has been pushing in the women's throat the last 150 years, and it's working. It's working. So, mute by unable to speak the truth, deaf to the word of God, deaf to the true Catholic faith. And St. Paul says they're gonna, there's going to come a time when men will have itching ears. They will want to hear something new. Let's get into Hinduism. Let's get into Eastern mysticism. Let's get into a new understanding of Christianity and all this modernist poison that is infiltrated inside the Catholic Church, corrupting monasteries, emptying out seminaries, emptying out convents. You could go today to the Trappist in Gethsemane in Kentucky, once a glorious Trappist monastery producing saints and now, look at their bookstore, and look at this, it's, it's just, at least they wear their hat in, but their heads are filled with modernism. And all the books written by that modernist, Father Thomas Merton, who started off good but ended bad, his books are all published there on Hinduism, Protestantism, Shintoism, and whatever other ism, ism that's there of Eastern mysticism. He, he tries to imbibe all of this into the Catholic faith, 
And you cannot mix light with darkness, as St. Paul says. You cannot mix oil and water. You cannot mix Christ with Satan. They don't mix. So let's hear some sound Catholic truth here. I am going to just read a great summary done by uh, a priest 25 years ago out of Richfield. He ran the retreats, and he did a great job, and he did a great summary of the ideas of the revolution. And I'm going to touch here on how the revolution has infected Catholics. Liberal ideas amongst Catholics, especially in the West, and in particular, our interest in the USA. He says, it is really sad to see how strong is the Catholic liberal current in our own country. The roots have, of course, to be found in the liberal ideas springing from the French and American revolutions. They are not different. The American Revolution wasn't bloody because there was no Catholic society. So it was easy ground. But the French Revolution was extremely bloody with the guillotines and martyrdoms of hundreds and thousands of priests, nuns, faithful, because there was a Catholic society to, to, to knock off. But the ideas are the same. But the one who spread these ideas inside the American church back in the 1800s was Cardinal James Gibbons. He was the Bishop of Baltimore, the founder of, of the Americanist heresy which was condemned by Pope Leo XIII in 1895 and in 1899. We've got to be reminded of this, because Americanism is really a heresy. And what it teaches, basically, is not condemning, obviously, true patriotism. That's Catholic. You love the land where you live, where your fathers live, where your fathers are buried, where your ancestors plowed the fields. That's not what this Americanism is, is about. Americanism is turning man into God, scorning the contemplative virtues, and uh, exalting separation of church, church and state and the liberal ideas. His foolish dream of Cardinal Gibbons was to marry, uh, make a marriage between the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, everything centered on God, and marry it with the ideas of the revolution everything centered on man. So what you got already is, is an appetizer to Vatican II in Cardinal Gibbons and all the liberal priests and bishops in the United States at this time. It would seem easier to get a square circle or a donkey to study St. Thomas Aquinas. Cardinal Gibbons, under Americanism, brought the poison of liberalism inside the hearts of American Catholics. And this is not just American Catholics now. It's the whole West, Canada, including South America. We're all imbued with these heresies. This poison is still there, more dangerous than ever, destroying brains and countless souls. In spite of the condemnations of Pope Leo XIII, liberalism brainwashed most of the American Catholics. Again, we could just say Western Catholics, including Europe. Here are some of the ways this liberalism creeps inside Catholic American souls. So he raises up six ways we're poisoned. And it's very important to study this because it strikes at the heart of the fight of the resistance, the fight against Vatican II, modernism, and the new mass. It's everything Archbishop of Feb stood for, and the solution is always the same, the reign of Christ the King in my soul, in your soul, in your families, in our cities, in our nation, and over the whole world. The reign of Christ the King. That's the only answer. And God wants it when the Pope will finally consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. When will this be done? <laughs> oh, when will this be done? God knows. God knows. It's going to take a miracle. Here are some ways this liberalism creeps inside Catholic American minds. First, through the heresy of Americanism. I would like to give only one example from a little booklet called God Bless America, published by the Salesian Brothers in 1991. It's a booklet found everywhere, even in Catholic traditional homes. On page 29 of this booklet, you find the following lines under the title, America's Gospel. 
It says, quote, Our country has a gospel of her own to preach and practice before all the world the freedom and divinity of man. That's Vatican II in a nutshell. There it is. We find two heresies in this liberal text. We have a special gospel for us Americans. We believe that man is God. And I, here he says Americans, but it's really the whole Western world, including Europe, as man has been made God. So that's the first way. We're just, we just breathe this in. I have my rights. How often even Catholics say this. It's a free country. I have my rights to think what I want. But we don't before God. I don't have the right to promote and support abortion. I have no right to, to believe and promote a false religion other than the true Catholic religion. Only the truth has rights. Second way we get poisoned, two, through indifferentism and liberty of conscience. Now pay attention, this is the heart of our fight right here. This is what Archbishop Lefebvre really hit on as the revolution. Here it is. Many Catholics believe that we have the right to follow our conscience and that each one can save his soul in his own religion. Even traditional Catholics think this way. Oh, he's a good Protestant. He probably saved his soul. These liberal ideas are solemnly condemned in the infallible encyclical Quanta Cura in 1864 by Pope Pius IX, where he condemns liberty of conscience as an insanity and a liberty of perdition. If liberty of conscience, which is I can believe what I want, is to be recognized as one of our rights, we are obliged to give women the right to kill their babies or to men to live as homosexuals. Indifferentism is solemnly condemned by the same Pope on that same year with the propositions 15, 16, 17, and 18 of the Syllabus of Errors, which is the most important text of the Magisterium against liberalism. Here are these condemned propositions. Here they are. Condemned. First, every man is free to embrace and profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. This is condemned. Now, it's hard for us to grasp this, and I, really I would need to repeat this a few times to sink it in. But in other words, to say I can believe, and any man is free to believe whatever they want, and still go to heaven, condemned. It's not true. It's a lie. It goes against Christ's teaching. Syllabus number 16, condemned. Man may, in the observance of any religion whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. Condemned. And that's why the Vatican II and these liberal errors kill the Catholic spirit. Because if a Protestant or Baptist can be saved in their false religion, then I, I'm not going to work hard to convert them and pray for their conversion. But true charity seeks to save souls and bring them to the true religion. Number 17, also condemned. Listen to this one. Good hope, at least, is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who are not at all in the true church of Christ. We got popes promoting this heresy. Pope John Paul II, the universal salvation. That anyone, as long as they're human, they can be go to heaven. That's false. Christ never taught that. Christ taught you must believe the doctrine I have laid down, or you will be condemned. So this idea of good hope, well, he might be saved. He was a good man. He was very generous. He was. Good hope, at least, is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who are not in the true Catholic Church of Christ condemned. In other words, there's not much hope for those who die outside the Catholic Church to save their soul. And if they do, it's only because God gave them a supernatural grace of what's called by St. Thomas Aquinas, baptism of repentance, a baptism of desire, where they receive that special grace to want to be and, and, and embrace and believe all the truths of the Catholic religion, and God gives them sanctifying grace. And this is not as common as many people believe.
because everyone, all of you are here today because you had to do study, you had to do research, you had to seek and pray to find where this, where's the truth in this mess. But God led you by his grace to know the true faith, the true mass, the true sacraments. It's such a grace. So everyone must has a duty to look for the truth. And the problem is most people can care less. Really, most people can care less. Number 18, condemned. Protestantism is nothing more than another form of the same true Catholic religion, in which form it is given to please God equally as in the Catholic Church. Condemned. So these propositions you just heard, condemned by the Church, this is Vatican II. It's the poison, the foulness, the septic tank of Vatican II. That's the heart of it. And it's a, it's a mockery against Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a turning the back against the love of Christ and spitting in his divine face. So, indifferentism and liberty of conscience, that's the second way we get poisoned. The third way liberal Catholicism creeps into us, third, through the belief that church and state must be separated. And we've got even homeschool kids, parents doing their best to teach their children, and yet they're using textbooks from the 40s and 50s promoting separation of church and state. So actually they're trying to save their kids from liberalism and they're raising liberals, and they're not gonna die for the faith. They can care less about the Catholic faith, really. And this is serious business, because we're all poisoned with that Protestant idea of there's the religious man in the church, on Sunday, and then there's the real citizen man who works from Monday to Friday or Saturday. And they're two separate things. When Christ is king over Sunday, he's king over Monday through Saturday. He's king over when you're at church and mass, and he's king over when you're at work with your co-workers or shopping or playing football or whatever. He's always king. All over all politics, economics, over, over the whole social life. And that's what we Catholics have to fight for again. The re-crowning of Christ the King over everything. That's what it means to be Catholic. And that means the Supreme Court needs to bow down before the laws of Christ the King and promote the laws of the Church. And therefore, condemn abortion, pornography, sodomy, and needs to put to death after a fair trial those who promote these destructive things more deadly than murder. Four, oh, um, let me finish this. Through the belief that church and state must be separated, the same syllabus of Pius IX condemned proposition number 55, which says, this is condemned, the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. If church and state must be separated, he says, Father, this priest, God has nothing to say about our legal system excepting abortion, divorce, and pornography. Fourth way that Catholics get poisoned, through the belief that our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be and ought not to be recognized publicly as king. Pope Pius XI clearly established the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ in his infallible encyclical Quas Primas, dated 1925. And Vatican II took that document, ripped it up, and spat on it, and said, we don't want Christ anymore as king. We want atheistic states, pluralistic states. And Archbishop Lefebvre, he understood this is the main problem with Vatican II. It's not first even about the mass. It's about the doctrine. And that's what the true Catholic resistance today is all about. It's about the doctrine first. But not just cold doctrine in a book, but the doctrine that imbues all our life, all society, imbued with the love of Christ. That's the real fight. Number five. The fifth way we get poisoned, through the belief that the Declaration of the Rights of Man is a wonderful document, when in fact this declaration has been solemnly condemned by Pope Pius VI. 
Now, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, if you read it, it sounds almost like the Declaration of Independence and uh, the First Amendment. It's the same. It's the same. So we Catholics who truly love our country, we want Christ to reign and not the Freemasonic ideas. And what is the fruit of the rights of man? Murdering over a billion babies worldwide since, since the 60s. Can you imagine? When Our Lady said whole nations will be annihilated, well, abortion has annihilated more than one nation. If you count all billions who have been ab aborted, it's fri frightening. And then, uh, and then all the other perversions. And then the last point, we get poisoned to the belief that democracy or republic are the only two good forms of government. Now this one, <laughs> boy, uh, many Catholics have a hard one, a hard time with this one. Even many priests, even traditional priests. Through the belief that democracy or, or the republic are the only two good forms of government, when Pope St. Pius X warned Catholics about democracy in his encyclical, Our Apostolic Mandate in 1910. About this subject, it is of the utmost interest to discover that when the book of Father Sarda e Salvani, in his book called Liberalism is a Sin, you should all read that, it's a great little book, Liberalism is a Sin, it was translated into English. The translator changed the title which became what is liberalism. But also he completely forgot, quote unquote, forgot to translate chapter 13 of the Spanish edition, the chapter which is the most important for us Americans. <clears throat> Here is a summary of the part which was not translated. Quote, the democratic or popular forms of government are perhaps not liberal speculatively speaking, but they are liberal in fact. Because these forms of government, democracy and republic, are permeated with the heretical liberal principles. The most perfect form of government is the monarchy, says Father Zilho, <coughs> which is the closest to the government of God and of the church. The most imperfect form of government is the republic for the contrary reason. One virtuous man is needed to have a good monarchy. But the majority of citizens must be good to have a good republic. The fact that the Freemasons have always tried to implant and spread public republics and democracies is enough to push Catholics away from these forms of government. So that's pretty heavy. And as Catholics, we want the reign of Christ the King. And that means over our country. And he must be reigned as king over democracy. But the liberal ideas behind democracy are authority comes from the people, but it doesn't. It comes from God. And the second big error of modern democracy is it's the majority vote that established the truth. So if the majority of people vote for abortion, vote for <coughs> sodomitism to be spread, then it must be true and accepted. But that's false. Numbers don't make truth. God makes the truth. Christ came down and spoke the truth. And it's for man to obey the truth and submit to it. And that's the only remedy for our decaying modern world. It's decaying. The suicide rates are sky high. The abortion rates, as I'm speaking, there's probably been over a thousand abortions in this semi-long sermon. Over a thousand children aborted. And maybe I'm, I'm probably underestimating because of the contraception, the birth control pills, which actually kill the baby in the mother's womb. So liberalism, in its, it, it, it seeps into us, first through Americanism, second through indifferentism and liberty of conscience, third through the belief that church and state should be separate, fourth through the belief that our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be and should not be recognized publicly as king, Fifth, through the belief that the Declaration of the Rights of Man is a great thing. Sixth, through the belief that democracy or the republics are the only good forms of government when they're not. So, dear faithful, uh, what you just heard is really a summary of the errors of Vatican II. And these errors triumph at Vatican II. 
And that's why Archbishop of Fed stood opposed. And in the epistle of St. Paul, he, he, he loved that quote, and it's actually on his tomb. I have handed down what I have received. And that's the duty of all of us priests, of all of you parents, to hand down all of Catholic tradition and the catechism and the faith to your children. And bishops are supposed to be teaching this. And bishops are supposed to be condemning the new mass, condemning the errors of Vatican II. And what happened to our traditional bishops? The four of them consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre. And we can add now the three consecrated by Bishop Williamson. Where are they all in this fight? They're all starting to excuse the new mass. They're all starting to excuse Vatican II. One of them said, Bishop Fillet, 95% of Vatican II is acceptable. That's like saying 95% of your septic tank is edible. Pardon me, but that's the same thing. So we're dealing with a serious, as Our Lady put it at Fatima, a diabolical disorientation in the very minds of the Holy Father, the Pope, Pope Francis, and all these even traditional bishops. And I, St. Paul says, watch out, you who think you stand, because you may fall also. How we must pray, how we must humble our souls before God, and ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to keep me faithful, keep me in the line of Catholic tradition, in line with all the popes in the, in the stand of Archbishop of Fed. Don't let me swerve to the right by falling into sedevicantism, or the left by modernism and liberalism and accepting Vatican II, or excusing it and accepting the new Mass, or the motu proprio Mass, which is more of an insult. It's a camouflage liberalism, the, the motu proprio indult slash motu proprio mass and this is our fight dear faithful so fight on and remember the words of our lady of the you the children of the light it is now time for you to rise up and fight for my son defend the rights of the holy catholic church of tradition and carry your rosary pray the rosary wear the scapular spread the light of the true faith <clears throat> by your good example by your true charity by your praying for poor sinners who are running to hell, fast pace. And pray for uh, our seminarians in Our Lady of El Carmel and the new ones who are to come this year. Pray for them too, because uh, the, uh, the revolution always strikes at the seminaries. <clears throat> and this is the new seminary in Virginia of uh, the Society of Isaac 10. I know a lot of these good boys. They're good boys, good American boys who are generous and want to give their life to God. Some of them are my own nephews, but they're all being poisoned. All of them are being poisoned. They're accepting how we should be under the Pope, how we should be under the bishops, how we have to be legalized and canonically recognized, and they're forgetting the biggest warning of Archbishop Lefebvre, where he said, to his priests, you must warn the faithful. The greatest danger for our faithful and for our priests is to put ourselves under modernist Rome and under these conciliar bishops, because they will use, rather abuse their authority to crush the faith out of the sheep. And the proof is, look at all the groups who have made peace in, in the uh, reconciliation and agreement with modernist Rome. Look at them all. They have all crumbled to modernism, liberalism, the new mass, and Vatican II. And that's what's now already, it's already done in the SSP Act. It's finished. They've already been poisoned. It's in the bloodstream. And I repeat this a lot because you need to hear this. Because I was there in 2012 when that fax came in, in our Syracuse Priory, but it went to all the priories of the world, where Bishop Follet put out mandates you, the priests, will no longer preach against the agreement with modernist Rome. You will no longer mention the agreement with Rome. And then you cannot mention political figures, how they're Catholic polit politicians who are bad and they need to be rebuked publicly. And you're not to mention these things and a whole list of other things. So you talk about declawing the tiger. You talk about making bunny rabbits out of priests. 
That's exactly what the enemy wants. And they've succeeded within the SSPX by infiltration from the top. And it's happened right before our eyes. So here we are, the handful of priests about the world of the real Catholic resistance. By the help of God's grace, by the help of our Blessed Mother, pray for us, pray for the seminarians to be good, anti-liberal, Catholic, anti-modernist, <coughs> anti-Vatican II, anti-New Mass, but really for the reign of Christ the King type of priests. That's what the world needs. But above all, we've got to keep the rosary and pray for a Pope, whoever it'll be, whatever it'll be, to finally obey the Virgin Mary. That's at the heart of, the, of any restoration. Why? Because our Lord wants to reign, and he's going to reign in spite of his enemies, as he said. But he wants to reign through over the whole world through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's why the Pope must consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Russia has played a huge role over Vatican II. The Judeo-Masons and the Communists, they had a huge influence on Vatican II. That's why Vatican II did not condemn communism. That's why Vatican II didn't consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, because the Judeo-Masons at the higher levels in Russia and, and in Wall Street and in Rome, and they all work together. They don't want Russia consecrated. But that must be done, that's what Our Lady asked. And you can look at Russia now, compare Russia to the West, rest of the Western world. You can see how maybe Russia is being prepared for its conversion. Because in spite of, I don't you know, I'm not canonizing Vladimir Putin, but he's the only leader banning homosexuality and their parades at public levels. He's the only world leader left who is doing steps to stop abortion. He's the only world leader left that gathered together the large families and awarded the large families to encourage the Russian people to have many children in their families. Think of that. Think of that. And he's a schismatic orthodox. So imagine if, if, the, if the Pope will consecrate Russia, the, the flood gates will open over Russia, and through Russia, the conversion of the whole world to the Roman Catholic faith, to the reign of Christ the King. This is what God wants. But these stubborn popes, these stubborn popes, and that's why I really think when Our Lady said, pray for the Holy Father, for they will have much to suffer. I think Our Lady meant not in this world, but in purgatory or even in hell. Just think of the damage under Pope Paul VI, who brought in the new mass. Pope Paul VI, his body was rotting. The day he was died, his body was already stinking. The Swiss guards were passing out already. They had to cover his body with the plexiglass, and they call him blessed? No way. These phony canonizations. But they have to bring these fake canonizations and beatifications to promote Vatican II. But with the grace of God, you can see through it. So hold fast to tradition and beware of liberalism seeping in. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.